The last sighting of schoolgirl Natasha Ryan from Rockhampton, Central Queensland, Australia, dates back to September 1998. Concerns grew among her family upon learning about her activities prior to her disappearance. Eyewitnesses reported seeing the 14-year-old conversing with a man in an alleyway near the local cinema before she seemingly vanished without a trace. Unfortunately, Natisha wasn't the only one missing from the area. It was discovered that four other women had also disappeared. Julie Turner, 39, Beverly Lego, 37, Sylvia Benedetti, 19, and Kara Steinhardt, 9. Unlike Natasha, their bodies were later discovered. The community of Rockhampton was gripped by fear. Residents avoided the movie theater and refrained from nighttime travel. Eventually, the town practically shut down, with people staying indoors. Amidst the panic, law enforcement focused their attention on one primary suspect. Authorities suspected Leonard Fraser's involvement in the disappearances, yet lacked substantial evidence to secure a conviction. To prosecute him, they required a confession. Fraser, believed to be a serial killer, was already serving time for the death of a nine-year-old girl in April 1999. Law enforcement linked him to the disappearances of all five women, including Natasha Rayan. Although Fraser was already serving a life sentence and ineligible for parole, authorities sought concrete evidence connecting him to Natasha Rayan's disappearance. However, they knew this task wouldn't be simple. In November 2000, a breakthrough occurred when Fraser boasted about his actions to a fellow inmate, unaware that law enforcement was eavesdropping. This success was attributed to Alan Quinn, a renowned con man in Australia, whom authorities enlisted to assist. Given the opportunity to redeem himself, Quinn eagerly accepted the task. He devised a plan to manipulate Fraser into revealing the whereabouts of Natasha Ryan and the other women's bodies. Fraser, known for his intimidating demeanor as a former meat cutter, was not someone to be approached lightly. Yet, Quinn was willing to confront the risks involved in engaging with him. Fraser was ultimately convicted for his crime against nine-year-old Kara, but he had not confessed to harming Natasha Ryan or the other three initially missing women. This was a crucial breakthrough that Quinn was determined to achieve. Law enforcement equipped Quinn with a recording device which they monitored during his conversations with Fraser. Over the next two years, Quinn persistently engaged with Fraser until he divulged the horrifying details of his actions. The information Quinn obtained from Fraser enabled Detective Dave Hickey to locate the victim's remains. Fraser was eventually transported via the governor's personal jet and led authorities through the jungle outskirts of Rockhampton, where the women's remains were discovered. While the remains of Julie Turney, Beverly Lego, and Sylvia Benedetti were found based on Fraser's guidance, Natasha Ryan remained elusive despite detailed maps provided by Fraser. Fortunately, Quinn's testimony played a pivotal role in holding Fraser accountable for his crimes. Midway through Fraser's trial, there was a stunning turn of events when the victim he was accused of harming, Natasha Ryan, unexpectedly appeared. This revelation left the courtroom, legal teams, and most importantly, Ryan's grieving family in a state of utter disbelief. It was later revealed that Ryan had been hiding in a wardrobe at the residence of her 26-year-old boyfriend, Scott Black, not far from her mother's home. Astonishingly, Ryan had been staying there for years without detection. Natasha Ryan's sudden reappearance threw a wrench into the prosecutor's case against Leonard Fraser, leading them to drop the charges against him regarding her disappearance. However, charges for his other crimes remained unaffected. Natasha Ryan's family, convinced of her demise, had held a memorial service for her. However, a tip-off led police to Scott Black's home, where they found Ryan. To confirm her identity, her father, Robert, asked her over the phone about her pet's name, to which she provided the correct answer. Jenny, Natasha Ryan's mother, was initially shocked when the family's lawyer, Ross Lowe Monaco, informed her of her daughter's survival. Initially skeptical, Jenny's doubts vanished upon seeing her daughter again, resulting in an emotional reunion. To evade a widespread police search, Ryan lived as a recluse inside her boyfriend's home, 
avoiding the numerous appeals for her return made by her parents on the news. However, Ryan's troubled past included substance use, multiple runaway incidents, and reportedly confiding in a school counselor about a pregnancy before her disappearance. The question remained, why did she choose to vanish this time? Although Scott Black was not responsible for kidnapping Natasha Ryan, his deceit led to Leonard Fraser's false accusation. Consequently, Black pleaded guilty to perjury and received a one-year prison sentence. However, this incarceration didn't sever his connection to Ryan. Rumors circulated that Natasha Ryan eventually married Scott Black in a small ceremony. They purportedly flew from Brisbane to Melbourne after the wedding. But did Ryan's family attend? Indeed, Ryan's mother, Jenny Kerwin, and father, Robert, were among the approximately 35 guests at the wedding. Despite the tumultuous past, everyone seemed eager to embrace a brighter future and put the past behind them. One particularly special guest for Ryan was her son, Corey, who was present to witness his parents exchanging vows. Reportedly, Ryan earned $200, thousand by selling the wedding photos to Woman's Day. However, it's alleged that she has yet to repay the $160, thousand incurred by investigators during the search for her.